G2, good Brandon, to see you today. I'm really excited to be here and talk about actually analytics and future on AWS. I know, we're here, we have our Orchid side chat today. That's uh, right. You know, so looking forward to spending a little time with you. So I know you've spent a lot of time, particularly the last week or so, talking to our customers. So you know, it's kind of a tough year for everybody. Mm -hmm. Data still seems to be a pretty high priority for a lot of our customers. So what are you hearing from our customers? Like what are their top priorities right now, kind of given current conditions? And That's a great question. I think I am seeing that customers are actually looking to become even more data driven to make their decisions. And they are thinking about using the data from across their enterprise and even from their partners yeah. and um, like to make these better decisions to grow the customer loyalty, to grow their customer base yeah. and optimize their operations. And organizations, they're actually well on their way to uh, transform their business through digital. Now they have all this data. Now the question is, how can we use this data yeah. to innovate new product experiences or um, make their business uh, better overall? Um, now, in this environment, yeah. cost efficiency is top on their mind. Absolutely. And they are really looking for ways by which they can actually do the same with less or even more yeah. uh, with less. Right. Great. So it's great. So priority there is mm -hmm. still really important for customers, right? They're realizing um, right now in, a, in kind of current conditions or really any time, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's better to make data driven decisions uh, to inform how you're driving your business. But what are the what do they see as the hurdles? What's what's holding them back from being able to kind of really kind of make the progress that they're, they're looking for? So I what we are seeing is that like the digital transformation is giving them this really uh, great data that they can make it, they they can improve their uh, customer experiences and business. Yeah. But you know the making that transition it's hard, yeah. right? We are finding that like you know this is a recent Accenture study found that like two out of three uh, organizations are struggling to gain value from all of these data. That's a lot. And and when when we talk to customers and we are seeing that there are like you know cultural barriers, mm -hmm. uh, there are process barriers, and there are technology barriers. And you really need to address them like you know, across the board right. uh, to, like, you know, to gain and uh, unlock the potential of this data for their customers and the business. And um, one of the really important cultural barrier is the siloing of data mm. within their own organization. Uh, you know, the, um, the typical model is that like, you know, data was actually trapped in the, their own organizational unit, maybe yeah. sales, maybe uh, finance, and then how can you actually just uh, uh, unlock that? Okay, move right. to a model where uh, it's you have broad access without necessarily the high friction centralization that needs to happen with it. Uh, that's a Im really important aspect. And then on the technology front, uh, I think the use cases are actually quite diverse. Right. And uh, it's really important to provide the right tool for uh, the right person. So, you know, how do we actually just provide this breadth of tools for all of the use cases, for all of the job functions? That's really important. Yeah. So, yeah, and we I know we've, we've spent a lot of time investing in, you know, kind of a broad analytics strategy. Um, but we also, more and more, right, as organizations are trying to become data-driven, they're really looking mm -hmm. at how do they democratize and help enable really everyone in an organization to have access the data they're supposed to and be able to you know analyze that and make decisions so how are we how are we addressing that how are we getting getting to those users so I mean the first step uh, yeah. in in this journey is to be able to unify this data sure. um, so bring all this data together uh, in a place where you can actually provide this access right so yeah. I mean if you think about it like you know you um, you need ETL, right? So you're actually just uh, writing these jobs that are actually bringing uh, the data from your operational system, maybe, which may be Aurora, and then bring that into uh, into a data lake or into Redshift for data warehousing. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those you cannot actually just uh, the raw data that you're bringing from your operational systems that's yeah. not directly usable. You would need to actually just uh, normalize it. You may need to actually enrich it with uh, some information you have about customers that may be in Salesforce. So I mean, we are building Glue as yeah. a service with all of these capabilities uh, to, like, you know, help customers actually just unify this data. Yeah. Now, um, you know, writing all these jobs and maintaining it, um, 
it's a, it's a tall, tall task. And then as applications evolve, then you need to go back and fix the right. they like you know fix the schema changes so one of the really important initiative is to actually just move towards the zero etl future yeah. so where uh, you know as we have actually done with the aurora integration with uh, redshift where uh, you simply configure and then the transaction as it is committed into Aurora is actually just made available in Redshift. And we anticipate that we would kind of just double down on this and then uh, expand the like capability to all of the data sources and into Data Lake and Redshift. And we are actually taking it one step further where uh, if you look at what we are doing with Glue data quality, uh, again, we are actually making it yeah. declarative and configurable so that you can uh, go to Glue um, a console, you can say, okay, just suggest me a set of rules that I should apply to this particular table. Yeah. And then once you actually review, you can accept and automatically Glue is going to monitor for data quality. So this transition that we envision is that, um, you know, we want to actually just make things uh, through configuration right. and through declarative specification yeah. and so that you can focus your attention on creating value for your business right. rather than dealing with these jobs or dealing with infrastructure. You know, the heavy lifting and kind of a low value add, you know, like capabilities, right? That it's part of that. It's required uh, to get data in the shape you need it to, but no one likes to do it. So that's, that's great. I know we've, uh, had a lot of positive reception for a lot of the vision we have for zero ETL. So yes, zero ETL exciting. has really resonated with customers. Yeah, so it's exciting uh, to, to learn more about that um, you know, as we go here. So uh, fantastic. All right, so uh, we've talked a lot about you know getting getting to this kind of zero ETL future and uh, breaking down a lot of the barriers for data integration, getting it all in one place. But once it's there, you're really looking at okay, how do we dress that next headwind? How do we make that data useful? Right. So what are they? kind of the broad set of capabilities that we have for our analytics. If we could kind of talk about that a little bit, that would be Yeah, great. I mean, like once you unify the data, then now you're actually trying to analyze it uh, with a broad set of tools to actually get the most value from it. And like, it, this is a place where AWS has the most comprehensive set of uh, analytical capabilities um, and with the most flexible deployment models. Right. Um, so, I mean, like a, a typical pattern is that like you bring it together, build a data warehouse, uh, build a Snowflake schema, yeah. and then you are doing SQL analytics. And Redshift is actually really built to scale uh, at really large scale with uh, running at petabyte scale. And in fact, like you know, I learned from Epo recently that yeah. we have a customers actually processing exabytes of data. That's wild. Uh, using Redshift across like you know, these uh, tens of thousands of clusters. That's wow. really amazing. A billion, billion bytes of data. That's, uh, that's a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so uh, you're actually doing this analysis, and uh, with Redshift, I think like you know the Redshift storage is actually built for really high performance. It, it is on S3. It mm -hmm. has all of the like you know the cost effectiveness and the reliability of S3, but it is really built with this high performance format that uh, enables you transactional consistency, like you know updates. For GDPR compliance right. and really small writes, so that you're actually getting the freshest data. And then Redshift SQL uh, Analytics is actually just has the best uh, performance when you measure it by like you know TPC uh, TPC DS, and mm -hmm. um, you know so we benchmark pretty consistently yeah. against uh, the alternatives, and it has the best performance. Now uh, Redshift actually enables you to like you know analyze uh, using SQL, not just the data in Redshift, uh, you know, uh, managed storage, right. but also data that is in data lakes, right? So it's the, uh, you know, for your SQL analytics and data warehousing, you have Redshift and it gives you uh, the, like, you know, highly high performance uh, SQL analytics on all your data. That's amazing. Lots of flexibility, not your, uh, not your, your dad's uh, data warehouse, one might say. So it's uh, definitely a modern approach and I know we've spent a lot of time and and a lot of innovation and, and making that really kind of a central piece to a lot of our analytics capabilities. Absolutely. So. And now some of the customers, uh, they want to actually analyze uh, all this data with uh, uh, with Spark, right? right. So, or um, like, you know, other um, open source uh, processing frameworks like Hive, 
uh, or actually just Ray now. So for that, we actually just offer this open source analytics. Right. Um, so you have the ability to actually just uh, like you know use EMR, Athena, or actually just Blue with Ray to like you know analyze um, all this data uh, in open formats in S3 directly, like Iceberg, mm -hmm. or actually data that is in Redshift. Um, one of the uh, key innovations that we did was this really high performance connectors uh, connectivity from. Uh, from Spark into mm -hmm. data that is in in Redshift. So, like you have the ability to actually just uh, have um, this access to breadth of open frameworks uh, for doing your analysis um, uh, on this data. Right. Right. Um, now, um, you know this is uh, one of the things that customers are really looking for is that how to uh, like you know move some of their processing upstream even mm -hmm. as the data is generated right yeah. so uh, real time processing so uh, the we are providing actually just really great solutions uh, managed solutions uh, for kafka and kinesis for your data streams and now you can actually use uh, something like flink uh, right. or spark streaming to be able to analyze all of that data and then be able to actually have that like you know, that insight um, in seconds, uh, in addition to being able to actually process them uh, at scale using something like Spark, uh, that is actually like that would give you this exploratory analysis for your data science. So you have the ability to cover, um, you know, great SQL analytics uh, using Redshift, uh, access to all these open frameworks for building uh, big data processing applications, right. and be able to take some of this analytics uh, real time uh, with our real time services uh, like Kinesis and MSK. A growing set of analytics that uh, customers are actually doing is uh, sort of log analytics, mm, right? Right. Um, you're collecting all of this um, like activities that you're actually getting. It may be um, a logs that is generated by activities on your systems that mm -hmm. your DevOps person might right. want to actually deep dive into, or um, it's actually just tracking activities from your customers, and you're trying to actually get an understanding of the uh, trends in terms of customer behaviors on your shopping cart, for example. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of the really powerful capability to do all of this log analytics uh, is open search. Now, it gives you this really flexible way to actually analyze um, log patterns, right. um, which uh, may be used by somebody uh, in um, security, and they would apply sigma rules that yeah. is built in to actually understand uh, anomalous behaviors. Yeah. Uh, uh, in the system, or somebody might be actually using it to understand actually how does uh, a shopping session is tracking right. across these logs. Right. So, you know, we have across these capabilities, uh, you know, we are providing these really powerful capabilities from SQL into like, you know, log analytics uh, with a really uh, great scale and price performance uh, for all of the technical users working with data. That's great. Yeah, so it's, it sounds like you know we we really build kind of this uh, candy store of, mm -hmm. of data tools and uh, be, be able to access you know any type of data you could possibly imagine. Uh, we've talked a lot so far about technical users, so we feel like we they're well cared for for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so what are we doing for more business type users? So like mm -hmm. the the Brandons of the world, right? Mm -hmm. We're out there where we're not necessarily data engineers, but we need access to data that's going to help us. Drive the business, make really great decisions. So, what are we what are we doing there for those business type users? Yeah, so I think, like, you know, in, in some ways, I think one of the key aspect of our vision is that data is for everybody, right? right. Uh, you you get essentially this transformation when, like, every person in as part of their job has access to uh, the best information for them mm -hmm. to actually make the best decision or serve their customers customer the best way. Right. So, um, to really truly dramatize uh, access to data, that's why we actually built QuickSight. So uh, QuickSight gives you this great visual experiences for interacting with data. And with QuickSight Q, I think this is actually a big innovation that we introduced where uh, we enable people to uh, get access to this, uh, this information or uh, interact with uh, information using natural language. So in some ways, like with QuickSight Q, with its uh, serverless deployment model and the ability to scale to organizations that is yeah. you know as large as Amazon you know yeah. this Amazon has like you know this one account that like you know is serving hundreds of thousands of Amazonians wow. uh, using QuickSight where they are getting access to the right information to do their job better each day right. so we are kind of using QuickSight as a way to scale um, access to information 
and uh, data-driven decision making uh, to every person in the organization, mm -hmm. um, like no matter what their level of technical skill is. Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great uh, kind of vision there that you've summarized. And you know, I'd like to probably touch on something a little bit. So you talked a little bit about Quick Psych Q, and there's a lot of like natural language processing capabilities and starting to kind of get into this realm of where well, we've been on this path for a couple mm -hmm. of years, where kind of the lines are not so clear anymore between analytics and AIML, and the world, those worlds are, are continuing to converge, uh, you know, more increasingly. So how are we in thinking about, you know, what's your mental model for how we're thinking about AI and ML and how we enable that? Not just for, we're doing a great job, again, for technical mm -hmm. users, data scientists, but how are we bringing a lot of those capabilities more into our services? So there's, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you touched on a really important, uh, like, you know, a trend that we are actually seeing. You know, the the divisions between, like, you know, this uh, ANML and another DAGs, that's quite blurry, right? right. Yeah. Because if I look at uh, the day-to-day -day of a data scientist, I mean, it's, you know, the estimates are actually just weighty, but, you know, they spend majority of their time making the data ready so that uh, they can translate this uh, information like a data in a data lake or data warehouse into features that they can they yeah. then build a model on, right? So this is the reason why we kind of integrated uh, SageMaker Studio natively with uh, our uh, analytical services yeah. like uh, EMR and Glue. Um, now, it's a uh, you know the the ML actually goes both ways, right? right? You know, you create this model, but uh, you need to make sure that, like, you know, this model is integrated into decision making. This is why, you know, we uh, make sure that, uh, like, you know, this ML models are integrated into Aurora so that you can build applications on top of it. Or it can be, like, you know, brought into Open Search or Redshift, where you can actually use that to score. Um, you know, your lifetime value of customers or mm -hmm. actually just further improve your search results. So you really need to actually think end to end. How do you make it really accessible um, for the data scientists to get at the data that right. may be in, uh, in data lakes and data warehouses? And how do you bring these models uh, into decision making uh, into like you know, as customers are building these applications um, in, uh, in using open search or actually just uh, scoring, like a job case is an mm -hmm. example where uh, they have they are using Redshift ML for um, scoring every one of their tens of millions of customers getting against every new job yeah. and uh, to provide the right matching uh, for that. So I think like you know the the roles of data scientists and uh, the roles of actually just uh, data engineers that is actually becoming a lot of lot more porous and ML is going to become essentially an integral part of all applications yeah. that are actually being built uh, to serve the application users better. Yeah. Yeah. I've always felt that, you know, when a, initially when a new kind of technology comes to, comes to the fore, it's oftentimes a lot about that technology. How are we mm -hmm. using that technology, you know, in isolation? You know, because uh, I think back to the early days of big data, so it was all about, you know, okay, how do I build a Hadoop cluster? So mm -hmm. now it's it's more of like an invisible set of capabilities where you see it's kind of, you know, combined with, a, you know, not just batch analytics, but a lot of other capabilities. So it's also how I see kind of AI and ML becoming, you know, over time is just this more seamless and visible. It's, it's kind of baked into our, you know, our, our capabilities and our services. So that leads me to think a little bit about, you were talking about model building mm -hmm. and, that's been a, a topic that's been, you know, uh, pretty pretty prevalent recently. Or a lot of talk around foundational models. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These, you know, massively, uh, you know, north of five hundred billion parameter models that are starting to come into the play and get a lot of attention that are being uh, applied for for uh, generative AI. Mm -hmm. So, wh what are we doing there? How, how are how are we kind of uh, you know uh, you know addressing that? Uh, and what do you think about as your kind of your mental model for how are we going to you know adopt that in the future? Uh, for for AWS, so it's a it's a great question. I think like you know this is um, you know we this is a point of inflection. I think right. like you know these large language models uh, they they have kind of shown the you know amazing ability to capture real world knowledge. Right, and and now we can actually. Uh, build a class of experiences um, that is going to be really differentiated for our customers. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, you know the like. Language models, uh, we've been actually working with them for some time. Like, for example, the Q natural language query is actually using a uh, language model to translate uh, the user questions into the right uh, visuals. Mm -hmm. Now, 
one of the things that we are really excited about is that these large language models, like what we announced with uh, Bedrock, um, they have the they have a lot better real world knowledge to actually really understand it. Like for example, mm -hmm. um, for getting the best experience in Q, previously the the BI analyst that is preparing the topic would need to provide term equivalences. Okay. You know, sales right. is the right. same as quantity, for right. example. Whereas these large language models, they come in with this knowledge and have the ability to actually just remove that undifferentiated heavy lifting from mm -hmm. preparing the data. Yeah, um, and this can this also can be applied to things like um, documentation of the of the data sets because one of that's one of the key things that we are actually building into data zone so this large model can be applied so when i step back i anticipate that like you know these large language models would have a really broad impact across all of our analytical capabilities so uh, i anticipate that you know just like um, we delivered code whisperer for people writing code, I anticipate there will be a whisperer experience that we would build into uh, right, cool. all of the places where cost, like you know, our users are interacting with our systems. I anticipate there will be a whisperer that is built into Blue Studio to help you be more efficient yeah. in uh, uh, in building data integration job. Similarly, like you know, this is uh, for uh, BI analysts that is actually building a dashboard, they would have a whisperer experience. Now, we can go one step further, right? Because in, in some ways, uh, it is possible for us uh, to create these virtualized roles, mm, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, today, like the, the business user, um, uh, they typically, for some, some data or topics that doesn't yet exist, mm -hmm. they interact with uh, a BI analyst right. uh, to, like, you know, start with a business question and you build, uh, go through the process of actually preparing the data, creating a topic, and turn it into a dashboard. Now, with these uh, large language model, uh, we can imagine a virtual BI analyst that the business user can interact, and uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, virtual assistant can really go through the uh, like the task of preparing the data and actually creating the right visual and enabling the business user to get their answer for a large subset of use cases. Yeah. So this way, the cycle time of actually having a question to like an answer comes down pretty dramatically and then takes the self-service BI to the next level. So that is really, really exciting. Now, we can take it even one step further because what typically happens is that when a business user uh, has one of these insights, mm -hmm. they need to communicate that with their peers. Right. So how can you create essentially a compelling story? Yes. Right. So these large language models can actually take uh, this uh, exploratory analysis that somebody has done and turn that into a story narrative that That's they can actually share it with everybody. So the possibilities of what this large language models and foundational models are actually enabling is really exciting. And one of the things that I'm personally really excited about is that Bedrock is bringing the best of these technologies that AWS has like you know, has been building over a period of time, like Titan. But mm -hmm. it's also giving us access to like you know, these amazing innovation that is happening in the ecosystem. So through Bedrock, we would actually get at the best of these capabilities in Amazon, but we also get uh, like access to these amazing capabilities that is coming from the ecosystem because the innovation in this space is exploding. It's amazing. Yeah, and it's it sounds like, you know, with, with generative AI, uh, depending on which articles you're reading, you know, it's, it seems like uh, everyone's prognosticating it's, uh, it's the replacement for everything. And so it's, it's not necessarily the replacement for everything, it's just gonna make everything much better, right? It's gonna make the experience more intuitive, it's gonna democratize um, access to more users and really, uh, improve collaboration quite a mm -hmm. bit. So um, that's that's amazing. Um, so collaboration, so that's a good segue and to kind of one of the next topics. So we talked at the beginning about the problems our customers were facing and one we haven't talked about yet is around uh, kind of organizational and people silos. Mm -hmm. So kind of the natural barriers that exist because someone's in organization A and someone else's organization B and they need to work together but sometimes it's not always easy. So how are we thinking about that problem. So, I mean, um, you know, this, we now have these powerful tools. Um, 
but these tools are actually only as good as the access to information right. that uh, is enabled by uh, the technology and the processes. Now, if you look at it, typical organizations, data is siloed, right? right? Um, now, with the cloud and the, the scale that we have actually created, uh, we have removed a class of barriers. Um, you know, this is no job is too big for right. the S3s or EMRs yeah. or Redshifts. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it is really important for us to actually enable uh, customers to be able to discover information across their enterprise. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, this is, uh, you need to have a right governance model so mm -hmm. that as this data is actually opened up, then you're actually meeting the non-negotiables, right. right? One really important aspect is that, you know, in uh, you know, governance, if you look at it as a defensive measure, then that leads to data being yeah. locked in. Yeah. Uh, one of the really important transition that uh, we need to make enable our customers to make is to think about governance as an offensive measure. Because yes. if you if you actually put in the right guardrails, then you can actually make the data really available right. for enterprise-wide discovery and like an you know, innovation, right? So I mean this is actually we've been actually on this journey. Uh, so like you know, with the Lake Formation and Glue Data Catalog, uh, we made it really easy for customers to uh, describe their data and specify the right access policies that is enforced across a, a range of systems. So you don't need to actually grant access uh, to Redshift and EMR and QuickSight separately. You can actually just uh, make the data like you know, available through Blue Data Catalog and set the access policies. And all of these systems would actually like is integrated with that. Now we are building data zone that is providing sort of the business layer mm -hmm. that sits on top of this. So you have the ability to actually describe data that is in S3, that's in Redshift, that's in any data source that is actually reachable through Glue Data Catalog. And we're gonna expand this to actually include any data that is actually in a customer's yeah. uh, like, you know, business <clears throat> so that you can discover them and you can facilitate this uh, cross-organization, yes. request for access right. and grant access, and then automate the configuration of the actual access in the data systems itself. So I'm really excited about uh, the journey that we are on with DataZone that kind of make this enterprise-wide data sharing really possible and low friction for our customers. Yeah, that's that's really exciting. So I think, I think you're right, I think a lot of folks do you say the word governance, it's like immediately this kind of defensive reaction that they start listing off on their head all these regulatory and compliance requirements and auditing requirements to go along with that. But I think you're I think you're right. I totally agree with you. It's really exciting and being able to enable secure access to all users in a trusted way, I, I think is gonna be um, really impressive and kind of the impact that's gonna have on a lot of organizations and getting out of these kind of data fiefdoms uh, where, you know, uh, Get rid, get, get rid of some of those control points and enable folks to actually you know, collaborate and work together more easily. So uh, that's that's really fantastic. Um, so we, we I think we've hit all of our topics. Uh, the last one that we haven't hit on yet, and I know again is kind of top of mind for all of us right now, mm -hmm. is uh, around cost optimization. Mm -hmm. So how are we thinking about cost optimization and, and what we're doing um, to help our customers there? Yeah, I mean, in some in some ways. Uh, the, um, the curiosity and the amount of questions or the amount of data projects, uh, it just is uh, far exceeds, yeah. uh, the, the growth of that is exceeding the growth of the budgets, yeah. right? So like customers are actually really thinking about actually how do we, how can they be more efficient overall, particularly mm -hmm. in this environment. Now, uh, price performance is one of the core values right. of um, AWS services. Mm -hmm. um, so like, and. Uh, there is a big advantage that we have because uh, we have tens of thousands of customers. We get to see how they use our systems mm. and then we can make them really efficient. Right? An example of this is that, uh, you know, Redshift um, observed that, you know, 90% of the queries are actually like a, a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And these are typically the BI dashboard right. uh, queries. So uh, we are able to actually optimize uh, Redshift and Athena uh, for these small queries. So if you look at actually the beyond the like industry standard benchmarks, mm -hmm. if you actually look at a concurrent BI benchmark, which is more real world, uh, what you see in the real world dashboarding scenarios, yeah. uh, Redshift is seven times better than uh, typical alternatives. So we are able to actually really look across 
the uh, look across actually the real world workloads and then uh, use machine learning mm -hmm. to improve our systems end to end. And being the price performance leader is a core value proposition. Right. And that actually goes to Redshift or uh, like open source framework like Spark where we've been actually investing in high performance engines. Um, we are now 4.7 times better uh, in terms of price performance measured by TPCDS, um, like uh, the, compared to the open source Spark engine. So this is an idea where we would consistently invest in uh, going forward. So Brandon, I think we go beyond actually just high performance runtime. So right. if you look at it, I mean, like we are making uh, all of our analytical systems services actually available in serverless. Mm. So this way, um, customers don't have to actually spend time uh, managing and scaling infrastructure. Instead, they can really focus all of their attention in solving their business problems. Mm. And uh, AWS actually offers a broad set of cost optimization program uh, like uh, reserved instances mm. or savings plans or mm. migration acceleration programs and uh, a set of specialists who can actually really look at your workload and then come up with uh, a great optimizations. Mm. Um, like, you know, the... Um, the EMR team I am aware of, they actually work closely with Roblox. And then there was a 70% improvement in uh, in cluster utilization uh, through this uh, engagement. So, I mean, like being, uh, enabling our customers uh, to be most cost efficient is actually one of the core uh, focus for AWS in how we build our services and how we actually partner with our customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. And that's actually more relevant today than any time uh, before. So we are actually really excited to continue our focus on this. So it sounds like uh, we we're really kind of covering a lot of the bases, a lot of our core customer problems. Uh, so very exciting. It sounds like we've got a lot of really interesting things coming ahead for us uh, in the future with uh, you know kind of new and interesting ways in which we're you know, taking traditional AI and ML and, and optimizing our systems based on those technologies, how we're making use of uh, these new foundational models and, and generative AI to also kind of improve the experience and to kind of open up, you know, kind of new uh, scenarios uh, for usage that really haven't been there before. And we're also working to really fully democratize uh, enterprise access to data. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's exciting. We've got a lot going on. So it's, you know, I, we all work, we both work on this every day, but I think when we sit down like this and kind of talk it out, it just uh, it's impresses me every time we do this. Um, so it was a really great catching up with you today, G2. So thanks for the time and uh, hope audience enjoyed it as well. And uh, thanks everyone for your time today. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, it's really exciting uh, what we have actually just done so far and then what's ahead of us. Mm -hmm.